Thank you so much. My name is Karen Tucker, and I have the pleasure to be CEO at the Churchill Club. Welcome to this very special event with Secretary of Commerce Penny Pritzker and LinkedIn CEO Jeff Weiner. Secretary Pritzker joins us here in Silicon Valley on her first official visit as secretary. She began a listening tour when she first came to office, and as her tour to our region shows, she is continuing to listen. And hopefully she will gain a lot of insights, ideas, and understanding from the technology and business leaders here. The Department of Commerce is considered to be the administration's innovation agency. And in that regard, Penny will talk about her objectives and ideas for how entrepreneurs and business leaders here might participate and have greater impact. Then, Jeff Weiner, one of Silicon Valley's most insightful and accomplished business leaders, will join her for an onstage conversation. And then finally, there will be a brief audience Q&A. We have an impressive group of people in the audience, from CEOs and other senior executives, to investors, entrepreneurs, government leaders, students, faculty, and members of the press. And there are three particular individuals I would like to acknowledge, or actually four who took the time to be with us today. They are U.S. Congressman Mike Honda, U.S. Congresswoman Zoe Lofgren, City of San Jose Mayor Chuck Reed, and City of Sunnyvale Mayor Jim Griffith. Welcome. <laughs> Five strong partners came together to co-present this program. They are Churchill Club, Silicon Valley Leadership Group, Tech America, TechNet, and Forward US. These nonprofit organizations share a common bond and interest to encourage innovation, economic growth, and societal benefit. If you are tweeting during this meeting, please do use the hashtag Churchill Club, and there are other Twitter codes in your programs. This program is being live streamed, so please let your contact networks know. The address is justin.tv forward slash plug and play tech center. That's J U S T I N dot TV forward slash plug and play tech center. Plug and play, one of Silicon Valley's most vibrant and important tech startup accelerators, is our generous host for this event. And for the conversation ahead of us, there is certainly no more fitting place for us to be. To date, Plug and Play has accelerated more than 1,600 technology companies, which combined have raised over $2 billion, and thousands of jobs have been created as a result of these successes. I'd like to call up the man who is largely responsible for this. Please welcome Plug and Play founder and CEO, Saeed Amidi, who will introduce Penny Pritzker and Jeff Weiner. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karen. I wanted to thank Karen and Churchill Club to bring uh, this event together. It is really an honor to be hosting this event. And uh, generally, I wanted to say entrepreneurship and innovation is in the heart of, I think, everyone in this room. And it's an honor to be the host to that. So Penny was sworn in uh, July 26 as the 38th Secretary of Commerce of US. Prior to this role, I think she was an uh, incredible entrepreneur and uh, I would call it a startup CEO, founded five companies uh, and created thousands of jobs, some of which was VI, which was formerly the classic residence for Hyatt. Also, she uh, did nationwide parking lots at airports and uh, other facilities, plus Pritzker Realty Group, as well as PSP Capital Partners. But the thing that is interesting, I think in this role as an entrepreneur and as a startup lady, I be like that because usually we all are gentlemen around here, but she truly understands the challenges of an entrepreneur and a startup. 
And I think she could play a very big role in this position, kind of helping the entrepreneur and the innovators. Penny also uh, was on mini board or is still in TransUnion, Hyatt Hotel, Wrigley's, and LaSalle Bank. She graduated undergrad from economics from uh, Harvard, and then she came to a better school. No, I'm just joking. She got her MBA at Stanford. You know, but the most interesting thing about Penny is her passion for entrepreneurs and innovation. And it's really a great, great honor and pleasure that uh, she would come to Silicon Valley. I think she has planned to visit Facebook, Google, and eBay tomorrow, Facebook this afternoon. And it's really an honor that she would pick one of the accelerators in Silicon Valley to make it her first stop. And really, this is what Silicon Valley is all about. And I think if she takes some of the conversations from Silicon Valley to the administration and make a link between the two, we could really change the world. Then I would like to also introduce Jeff Winner. It's, I believe there is not a meeting that I have ever going forward that I don't check someone's profile on LinkedIn before I have the meeting. He has had great experience uh, before that at Yahoo, and also he was an executive in residence at Excel as well as Greylock. But uh, he's sort of like one of those serial entrepreneurs that, you know, touches a company. And, you know, during his tenure at LinkedIn, I think the company has uh, blossomed to a great, great, uh, present and future. You know, I, I, I really love this social network, Facebook, but for a business person, LinkedIn is almost has become my Bible. So I think we're going to have a very, very interesting conversation between Penny and Jeff. And again, I wanted to welcome everybody and thank you for being here. So with that less said, please, our guest of honor, Penny Pritzker. Well, thank you, Karen. Thank you, Saeed, uh, for the warm introduction. I am thrilled to be here. Uh, my face lit up as soon as I got off the airplane, not the least of which is because of your wonderful sunshine. We're having a rough go of it back on the East Coast. Uh, you've heard of the polar vortex. It's uh, hitting us pretty hard. So it's great to be here, but not just because of the weather. And a big thanks to the Churchill Club uh, for this terrific event today. Uh, your organization deserves a lot of credit for stimulating extraordinary conversations that create solutions that benefit all of us throughout, not just the United States, but around the world. And I also want to thank the sponsors of this event and our host, Plug and Play, um, where Rev yeah, I got a great tour, and it's quite clear to me, revolutionary ideas are turned into companies that enrich our lives right here. So thank you very much for having me. And a special thanks to Jeff uh, Wiener of Th LinkedIn, uh, one of the most dynamic CEOs in our country. I really appreciate him agreeing uh, to uh, participate in this event. Um, plus, he's focused on something that is very near and dear to my heart. Uh, arming people for the jobs of the future. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but I can't wait to hear more about his views and how he's going to bring all that uh, to help uh, Americans uh, find better jobs and become better skilled for the opportunities out there. So I want to start the conversation with a confession. I'm a Silicon Valley girl. Uh, my family moved to the Bay Area when I was one. And I went to Castellea School in Palo Alto. And I came back here, as you heard, to graduate school. I went to law school and business school at Stanford. Uh, so as I tell my children, who are in their early 20s, I remember San Jose when it was full of fruit orchards. Uh, so it's extraordinary to be back here and see all the great creation that is happening here. 
the valley is not just a place of majestic beauty, it's also a dynamic and innovative ecosystem that is envied, not just across the United States, but throughout the world. Uh, you have something very special that every city wants to emulate. Uh, much of what makes America unique is our spirit of in innovation and entrepreneurship. Uh, and the Valley is an integral part of that. Today, the United States has six million workers who are employed in technology. And the highest concentration of knowledge and technology intensive industries in the world, representing 40% of our GDP. So for the past seven months, uh, since I took this position, since I left the private sector, uh, I have traveled across the country to incubators like Plug and Play, talking to innovators and CEOs alike. In Nashville at the Entrepreneurship Center, uh, I saw a startup that builds apps connecting doctors and patients. In Iowa at Douala is a startup that uh, built a network to transfer money between businesses without having a bank. Uh, in Washington, D.C., at the incubator called 1776, I unveiled the Commerce Department's policy priorities. And in Las Vegas, at the Consumer Electronics Show, I saw the technologies in everything from cars to thermostats to wearable health devices. So meeting with entrepreneurs, inventors, venture capitalists, and others across the country makes me very bullish about America's economic future. Often my travels, though, and during my travels, I wish I could bring more members of our talented commerce team with me to see firsthand our engines of innovation. And today, I'm very, very pleased to tell you that a number of our top leaders from our innovation team are here. This includes, and I'll point them out, uh, Pat Gallagher, who's right here. Uh, Pat is my deputy. Uh, in corporate speak, that's like your chief operating officer. He basically makes uh, uh, the Department of Commerce run. But he also has an amazing job. He is the director of the National Institute of Standards and Technology, which is one of the great hidden gems of our government. Larry Strickling, who I think is here, he leads our National Telecommunications and Information Administration. And he's one of the men that it, you really are looking to, to fight the fight for you. Michelle Lee, where's Michelle? Michelle's right here. You all know Michelle. She was from Google. Uh, and we stole her away to join the Patent and Trade Office. And now she's running the Patent and Trade Office. Uh, Joe Klimovich, now where's Joe? Is he here? There he is. Joe is our CIO at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. That is translation, the fish, and the National Weather Service. Uh, and Josh Mandel, where's Joshua? There he is. Joshua Mandel is my policy advisor for all things innovation. In fact, that's what his card says. Uh, our head of NOAA, or the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, she wanted to be here today but could not because uh, she was asked by the president to stay behind and brief the Western governors about the current state of the drought. Uh, we play a very important role, and I'll talk about that a little bit later in terms of information. But this drought, we know, has hit California very hard, and we're doing everything that we can at the Commerce Department to help. So this team and others at the Department of Commerce work closely with you to ensure our nation remains the global epicenter of innovation. So for us to keep uh, your pace of change, this leadership team is breaking down silos throughout our agency. I like to call this our commerce mashup. Over the next few days, our team is going to fan out across the valley to bring the Department of Commerce, us, closer to our customers. That's you. This effort is central to our new Open for Business agenda, which includes a keen focus on helping set the conditions for innovation, improving our competitiveness, opening markets, and unlocking more federal data for greater economic benefit. With the country moving at warp speed towards the internet of everything, our goal at the Department of Commerce as a service organization is to support you. 
whether you're a researcher, an innovator, an entrepreneur, a mentor, or an investor. Now you might ask how. How could you possibly be helping us? How do we interface with you and support you? So let me take you through that a little bit. First, we're protecting your ideas through the Patent and Trademark Office. To be closer to our customers, we recently opened one of our new satellite patent offices here in the Silicon Valley. We're streamlining the patent process and reducing patent backlogs so that new products and designs can get into the marketplace faster. In addition, we're focused on delivering patent reform that balances the protection of your ideas with curbing the abuses in the IP system, such as patent trolling. We're improving transparency of patent ownership, tightening scrutiny on patent claims that are too broad, and helping small businesses that are unexpectedly find themselves in litigation. And last week, the President announced a series of new executive orders that will make our patent system even stronger. This reform will allow American companies to remain focused on innovation, not litigation. But you might not be aware of all the other ways that the Commerce Department is your innovation department. We invest in digital infrastructure deploying 110,000 miles of broadband in the last four years. We're also making spectrum available for businesses. And we advocate to ensure that the internet remains open, free, and available on a global scale. We advance technology development through the best science, the right standards, and by supporting R&D. We produce and share important data from our Economic Statistics Administration, the Census Bureau, and NOAA. We support entrepreneurship and startups through regional investments and through my role as Chair of the President's Ambassadors for Global Entrepreneurship. Our team at the Commerce Department is also engaged as the pres at the President's request in the current administration's review of big data and privacy that is being led by John Podesta. This process is meant to explore how to promote the free flow of information while also supporting privacy and security. And for the first time ever, we're working closely with the Departments of Labor and Education to match our workers to good jobs. That means more industry-led training widely recognized and stackable credentials, and apprenticeships. All of this will help American workers climb ladders of opportunity. Today, I'm pleased to make two announcements that will drive even more innovation and opportunity. Both of these efforts are focused on unleashing data. So each day, NOAA collects and produces 20 terabytes of environmental data, from weather forecasts to climate change to ocean currents. This is twice the data of the entire printed collection of the Library of Congress every day. Yet only a small percentage of that valuable data, roughly two terabytes, is made easily accessible to the public. So to address that problem, I'm pleased to announce a new request for information which is the first step towards a public-private partnership that will enable more companies and communities to extract this data for creative uses. This new partnership will unlock, unlock more weather and climate information to stimulate the creation of new industries, boost economic growth, and spur employment. Why is this important? Consider the following. Weather and climate sensitive industries in the United States account for roughly one third of our GDP. So I know firsthand the value of putting more data in the hands of entrepreneurs. 25 years ago, I started my first company with the help of information from the Census Bureau. Which leads me to my second announcement. We have a tool called Census Explorer. It's an interactive map that shows basic demographics of Americans around the country. 
Today, we're adding tech workforce and payroll data to those maps so that entrepreneurs and business leaders like you can see where tech workers are geographically concentrated. You'll now be able to look at tech employment in regions, along with other factors like education, labor force participation, and home ownership rates. So check it out. It's called Census Explorer. Overall, we are making the federal government's information easier to use. In fact, our weekly economic indicators will now be available in API open format. This will allow entrepreneurs to directly use government-generated data to launch new products, apps, and startups, while allowing you and your businesses to make better decisions about investments and hiring. But we can't stop there. Our job at the Commerce Department also involves advocating for policies to grow our economy. As such, we must invest more in research and development. In the 1960s, it was government support of R&D that helped build this valley. And since taking office, President Obama has consistently pushed for increases in R&D. But we have to do more. For example, the president has called for a national network of manufacturing innovation institutes, where companies, large and small, in partnership with universities, can partner in pre-competitive research. Another way to grow our economy is by increasing trade and investment. Today, 95% of customers are outside our borders, and export-related jobs pay 18% more on average. You, the leaders in the technology sector, you know how critical it is to sell your products to foreign markets. Thus, we must move forward with potential new trade agreements with both Asia Pacific and Europe, involving two-thirds of the world's GDP. And we must give President Obama what other presidents have had, trade promotion authority to open new markets while protecting our workers, and our environment. We must also pass immigration reform, which I believe is both a moral obligation and an economic opportunity for our country. The fabric of America is woven by immigrants. That is especially true in, here in California, a place where many come seeking a better life. Andy Grove of Intel, Sergey Brin of Google, Jerry Yang of Yahoo, these are examples of the 40% of the Silicon Valley firms founded by immigrants. Joining us today is Ronaldo Gill, the founder and CEO of Ray Labs, originally from Cuba and the son of a factory worker. He enrolled in a job training program at age 18 and learned software development. Ronaldo is a serial entrepreneur. He launched a company that supported cloud computing for supply chains. And today, he and his wife, Linda, who I believe is also here, there they are, right in front of me. Uh, thank you for being here. Are creating sensor systems that detect problems in urban properties and affordable housing. He's also started a nonprofit for immigrant students and entrepreneurs. Immigration reform will grow our economy by an estimated $1.4 trillion over the next two decades and reduce the deficit. Reform will also attract and keep the best minds in America by providing visas to foreign entrepreneurs looking to start businesses here and green cards to those who obtain a master's or a PhD in STEM fields. Ladies and gentlemen, People like Ronaldo enrich us. That is why immigration reform matters and why we have to get this done. The bottom line is that we must use all of the tools in our economic toolkit uh, to help our economy grow. That also includes building first class infrastructure and enacting smart business tax reform. So before I close, let me just say that I am proud to work with a president that has done so much for innovation, science, and technology. So let's take a look at the facts. He put in place historic investments in digital infrastructure and clean energy. 
doubling renewable production for wind and solar. He launched Startup America initiative to accelerate high growth entrepreneurship with $2 billion in public and private resources. He worked to strengthen our leadership in fundamental research. He signed into law measures like the JOBS Act that are making it easier for innovative companies to go public and expand their workforce. He helped to save the auto industry and require new fuel efficiency standards that have helped make America's fleet cleaner and more innovative than ever. He established the first ever national chief technology officer and he is creating dynamic manufacturing innovation hubs throughout the country in 3D printing, lightweight metals, power electronics, and digital manufacturing and design. And yes, he delivered healthcare reform that has helped keep healthcare price inflation at its lowest growth rate in 50 years. This is reducing job lock, giving entrepreneurs the flexibility and security to take risks without worrying about whether they become ill. The New York Times reported yesterday that the law can be a boon to entrepreneurs, and another noted technology writer said it was fostering a startup frenzy. Simply put, I believe that President Obama has done more for innovation than any other president in history. So in closing, my commitment to you is that the Department of Commerce will be your voice for innovation, discovery, and entrepreneurship in the administration. It is innovation hubs like Plug and Play and many others I have visited across the country that are key ingredients to driving America's economic comeback. The ingenuity, grit, and resilience of you, our innovators, our workers, and our businesses has resulted in 2.4 million new jobs created last year. And while we have more work to do to lift incomes and expand opportunity and help businesses with the tools they need to grow and hire, both the President and I are optimistic about America's future. It is here at Plug and Play that, our, that PayPal, Dropbox, and many other companies were born. The world watches what's happening within these walls and in the Silicon Valley, where anything is possible and anyone with a good idea can rise to the top. The reason's simple, really simple. All of you, the dreamers, the innovators, the investors here today, represent you represent the best of America. You're open for ideas, you're open for innovation, and you are open for business, just like America is open for business. So thank you so much for inviting me to be here and giving me the honor to speak with you. Secretary Pritzker, thank you so much for joining us here today. My and uh, it is a, a real pleasure and an honor uh, to be here with you and uh, being able to, to moderate. And thank you to the Churchill Club uh, for that same privilege. So let's jump right in. Mm -hmm. You have uh, an incredibly impressive background in business <laughs> as both entrepreneur and investor. And I think for a lot of people in the audience today, looking at you and, you know, it, it may not be uh, the traditional path to Washington, certainly not a career politician. <laughs> and would you mind sharing with us your perspective when you were first invited uh, to take on the role uh, what your thought process was, what your perceptions of Washington were, and what it's actually been like in your first six months. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, Jeff, when the President asked me if I would be interested in taking this job, he, he described the job as follows. He said, what I really want is someone who will be a bridge to the business community, uh, to build and continue to build the relationships with the business community, and to make sure that the administration has the voice of the business community within it. And so for me, when I uh, came into the job and was sworn in, and that's a whole process you go through, so I had a little bit of time to think about it and learn about the department in advance, um, I came with a sign uh, uh, that I hung on my door. I have a rather well-known office in Washington, 
it has a long history, but that doesn't matter. There was a nail on the door to my office, and I hung an old-fashioned sign uh, like you might see in Main Street in the 1950s, and it said, Open for Business. And really, you know, what I wanted to do at the Department of Commerce was really um, make sure that we were all clear. Whoever walked through that door, whether it was someone working at the Department of Commerce, whether it was a head of state, or whether it was the lady cleaning or the man cleaning the office, that they understood that the attitude of this administration and the department is we are open for business, and that the business community is our customer. And therefore, the job is to really understand what are the issues facing American business, not only in the United States, but also around the world, and see what we can do about it. So I recently uh, had the opportunity to uh, visit in Washington uh, with a number of uh, Congress folks, Congress people, and uh, was struck by the interaction, the uh, awareness of what's going on in Washington right now, uh, the insight and a genuine uh, interest in helping and support. It is not necessarily what is being portrayed in the media day in and day out. And I'm interested to hear from you, what's been the biggest surprise since you've gotten to Washington, D.C., relative to your expectations going in? I think uh, uh, really a couple of surprises. First of all, the talent of the people who are working in our federal government. Uh, there are many talented people I know in my department. There are four, I, the Department of Commerce is about 45,000 people. We, um, we do everything, as I said, from the census to NOAA to economic statistics. And uh, we have 12 bureaus. So we have a very broad portfolio of things that we do for you, services we provide for you. And the people working there are very, very talented. And they want to do a good job. They are not the enemy as they're being portrayed often in the press. These are folks, they get up, they're just like you and me. They have families, they want to do a good job. They're smart, they've chosen a different path uh, in terms of being in government rather than being in the private sector. And they want to do a good job. And uh, the other thing that I've found is with a little bit of encouragement and a little bit of leadership, there's great teamwork actually. And I find in the administration there's much more teamwork than the way that uh, it's often portrayed. I mean, we're really trying to work together. It doesn't mean we don't disagree at times, but, uh, you know, as you know from your businesses, good product comes from healthy disagreement sometimes. What advice would you have for uh, those watching today about doing business in Washington, for those that need to, who may be hesitant because of the perception that it's going to be a bureaucratic process, it might slow them down. One recurring theme thus far today has been the extent to which you and the department and the government's open for business. But what advice would you give to people who need Washington, D.C.? Well, I, I, the advice I would have is, is you've got, you, you need to, um, I think relationships matter a lot. And I think getting to know your leadership, uh, both your local leadership uh, your local congressmen, your senators, and getting to know the people who are uh, uh, in decision-making positions. And then, frankly, those of us who are running departments, we're in the service business. We have, you, for the Department of Commerce, if we can help you, or at least guide you, if, you know, we're your ombudsman. And so, you know, feel free to reach out to us. That's part of what we do is help businesses as they're trying to navigate Washington. For example, we help, we also help businesses who want to export, but we also help businesses who want either reshore or foreign companies that want to bring their businesses to the United States, and we help them navigate through uh, the federal maze. And so that's, we view ourselves that way. According to the uh, Department of Labor, there's currently four million available jobs in the United States. That is the highest level of available jobs in at least the last five years. That numbers continue to grow, despite the fact there are 20 million Americans who are either unemployed, underemployed, or marginally attached to the workforce, uh, which seems somewhat counterintuitive. How could the number of available jobs continue to grow? And as you alluded to in your speech, there is an opportunity for all of us to be doing a better job in terms of educating uh, the workforce, the aggregate workforce, and ensuring they have the skills to take advantage of the opportunities that are and will be, as opposed to the jobs that once were. 
Could you talk a little bit about your vision for that in the Department of Commerce? Well, I'm glad you asked. I'm, this is an issue that's near and dear to my heart. Long before I came to the Department of Commerce uh, in 2009 and 10, I got in, I've been involved in public education for a long time in Chicago. But then when I came, um, after the president was elected, I was on his uh, President's Economic Recovery Advisory Board, and one of the issues that I focused on was this issue of the skills challenge that our country is facing. And I heard from businesses all kind. It, we talked to business people from all different kinds of industries, and I will tell you, just in, uh, in the last seven or eight months, as I've been in this job, I've probably talked to a thousand business leaders, uh, and I have, every one of them tells me about the challenge they have finding the workforce with the skills they need. And yet, we have four million open jobs, and we have lots of people who are unemployed. So, what's wrong with this picture? Um, and there's a lot that needs to be done, uh, in my opinion. I'll pick one aspect of it. If you look at today's unemployment, we have about 6.6% unemployment with a low participation rate. But let's just use today's statistics. Roughly about 4% of the 6.6, so 4 over 6.6, so roughly two-thirds of those people are short-term unemployed. They're moving from job to job, and that's not the problem. Two and a half over six and a half percent are um, people who are long-term unemployed. That is two and a half times higher than we've had in the history of the United States. So what's going on with the long-term unemployed and why are they struggling to find jobs when we do have open jobs? Uh, what we found, we started in, in Chicago, we created an, uh, a, an intermediary called Skills for Chicago Land's Future to address the issue of the long-term unemployed. The first thing we found is if you go to the employers, there's a bias against hiring the long-term unemployed. Recruiters basically, why take the risk? It's, you know, they'd rather go steal your employee and, and, and uh, produce them for somebody else than to say, I found someone who's not been employed for a year uh, and try and produce them as your candidate. And so there was a real bias problem that we found. So we actually created an intermediary where we go to employers first and say, if we can pr give you skilled, uh, long-term unemployed that are willing, that want these jobs, are you willing to hire them? That was a big culture change. So one is a culture bias. And the second is sometimes there is a skills gap. And then finding on-the-job training dollars or dollars to train those folks for uh, the jobs that do exist. And part of the other problem is small employers, it's very hard to train one person or two people. It's expensive, it's hard to do. So you really need the community colleges or the other training apparatus to help, which means sectors need to come together and say, we need X amount of people with these kinds of skills. And one of the challenges that we're working on right now with the Business Roundtable is getting uh, recognizable, stackable credentials so that someone who's come and worked for LinkedIn, who then goes to work for someone else, their credentials are, uh, are recognizable and acceptable to another employer. If only there were a site that captured all of that information via an easily searchable I have profile. A I have a feeling that there's uh, someone in this room who may be working on that. So uh, the, the only other mention of LinkedIn uh, that I'll, I'll do today is we're proud to have taken uh, the pledge to help hire long-term unemployed. That I know you. the president and, and people like yourself are extremely supportive of and would encourage other companies to do the same. As someone with your experience and passion for education reform, uh, two-part question. If you could change anything about generational uh, primary school education, what would it be? And if you could change anything today immediately about vocational training, what would it be? Uh, in the K-12 area, I don't think we've cracked the code yet of the combination of using technology to help so that I think there are technologies that allow y kids and young people to learn at an individual pace and an individual process depending upon what kind of learner you are. But we have not uh, been able to combine that with teachers, the technology, and having it be K through 12. And um, so I would 
I envision that over the next decade, the role of the teacher will evolve, the role of technology in K-12 is going to evolve as we see not just the Khan Academy, we see, we're experimenting with how to do education on a grander scale. Uh, and I think when we crack that code, I think America again will rise to where it has been. We've seen graduation rates are at the highest levels uh, ever seen uh, from high school, but there's a lot more we need to do for our kids. Um, I think the other challenge, having worked in a, one of the largest inner city school districts in the country, in Chicago, is um, everyone wants to do a good job. And we owe these kids uh, the kind of information and recognition of what are good jobs. You know, we've spent a huge amount of time, for example, teaching families that manufacturing, you don't want your kids to go into manufacturing anymore because they're going to ship the equipment abroad, et cetera. We are at the beginning of a generational change about this. A manufacturing job is not the manufacturing job when I got out of college, let alone high school. It has changed completely. And what's happening, the revolution that I believe is going on in this country because of our competitive advantage, and I get to see it up close and personal, being your chief commercial advocate around the world, and forgive me for turning my back to those of you here, um, is, uh, you know, as your chief commercial advocate, what I get to see around the world is the fact that with our rule of law, with the strength of our financial system, with the um, ingenuity and flexibility of the Americans, with our low cost and abundant energy, with the amount of money that we invest in R&D, with the fabulous universities that we have here, we are sitting in a fantastic competitive position. And we owe young people in this country a better understanding of the opportunity ahead of them and how to prepare themselves. And I think that uh, it's a combination of, uh, of making it real for families and making it clear, you know, geez, if I quit taking math in ninth grade, what is the implication of that? And it's not clear. Most, I mean, I, my kids went to great schools, and frankly, it was still kind of haphazard, this notion of, geez, it's worth it to get some, you know, continue on with certain skills that you need. Uh, and I think we owe kids that, and I think that's the effort that the Common Core is trying to get at. But we're at the beginning of figuring this stuff out and not making, you know, we're making progress. Don't get me wrong. I mean, God, you know, Secretary Duncan, who's, I'm a huge fan, has made an enormous amount of progress. But we have a long way to go. So I think we're going to open it up uh, to Q&A from the audience in just a moment. One final question. Uh, last year, one of the uh, best-selling books out there was Sheryl Sandberg's Lean In, mm -hmm. and it was uh, really her experiences and her journey uh, to becoming one of the uh, most successful executives in Silicon Valley. And uh, you've also had amazing success. So as the father of two young girls, and I'm sure there's a lot of other folks in the audience uh, with young daughters, what advice would you give them, uh, these young girls who would love to follow in your footsteps? Um, a couple of things I would say. First of all, I was really lucky to have good mentors. My mentors were male, and today you'll have more mentors who are female, but um, find mentors, look for mentors, ask for help, and be inquisitive because people love to help. Everyone in this room, you, if a young person asks your advice, you're dying to give your advice. You wish more people would ask your advice, right? Don't we all? Um, so one is uh, be proactive about that because, frankly, there's a lot out there. You know, people want to help your kids, and they want to help young people be better. Uh, and so one is mentorship, and um, the other is, uh, frankly, you know, I, the other thing I would say is I've been very lucky to, my husband's a doctor, but we have partnered together in raising our kids. So getting comfortable with the idea, it's a, it's a partnership, it's a team 
game, not a solo game, and the idea that as, as mom, everything falls to you, that doesn't really work if you're you know, in this day and age. And the third thing I would say is um, you have to get comfortable with the fact it's a little messy, right? We grow up and as, as young adults and we get it all neat and all organized or whatever, but when you start to get into being in business or running a business or starting a business and trying to have a family and having kids and all of this, it gets a little messy and you kind of have to forgive yourself a little bit that it's going to not always be so smooth, but it'll work out. Thank you. Okay, we're, we have some mics and some folks uh, out there who can help coordinate. So if you have a question, just raise your hand. Hi. Yeah. Um. Uh, I'm Alex. I, I'm an entrepreneur. I came to the U.S. when I was 18 to study computer science at MIT, and I also did a master's there, so Boston. Mm -hmm. um, and then with the optional practical training, I came to, the, to Silicon Valley, and I started a company with somebody from Stanford. Uh, and we've been fortunate the company has grown a lot. We're hiring three Americans right now. We're looking to hire more. Uh, my visa expires in August, so what would you advise for someone? There are many people in my situation, so what would you say to somebody like me? Well, first, you, you need to contact the State Department we, <laughs> to get your visa renewed. <laughs> uh, you know, this is, this is a challenge and one of the reasons why immigration reform is so important, because so much can be addressed through the bill that is passed through the Senate. Uh, and there are the votes in the House, if Speaker Boehner would actually let the bill come to the floor that support immigration reform. Uh, so my advice to you is obviously, uh, you know, either contact someone in the Department of Commerce and we'll help get you to the right people who at least can help you. I don't know what your visa situation is. Uh, and we're not the people who give you a visa, but we'll at least try and help you get to the right people. But this just underscores the reason why our, uh, or the Congresswoman, she'll help you. <laughs> right there. She's on her way. She already said There she up. is. See, that's, that's your government at work, right there. Right she's, there. she's literally standing behind you, if you didn't. Literally see behind you. She may have thought you were kidding around. No, right I'm not kidding. You. She's right there, and she will help you. <laughs> it's your tax dollars and your government at work. Uh, but basically, um, you know, it's one of the reasons we need immigration reform is because, uh, you know, not only will immigration reform, uh, as uh, the bill in the Senate, not only addresses the issue of the 11 million undocumented folks in the United States, that we have a moral obligation to help these folks figure out their status and help them become, uh, uh, come out of the shadows. But there's an economic opportunity, as I said in my speech, which is uh, whether it's the increase in the EB-5 visas, the increase in the number of H-1B visas, the fact that immigration reform staples a green card to a PhD or anyone with a PhD or master's in a STEM field. Uh, this is what we should be doing. We should be welcoming immigrants who want to be in the United States and start their companies here. We should be welcoming them, not asking them to leave after they've had a fabulous education at one of our great universities. It's crazy. So, uh, okay. that's my I, pitch. I have another question. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for being here, and I, I'm very happy to meet you, both of you. So. I've been on LinkedIn since, maybe since you started, but it's a great tool to me. So I chair a business association in San Jose, Storage Road Business Association, and I've been traveling to Mexico and Canada for the last four or five years, connecting a small business into San Jose and Silicon Valley. I can see how the world is globalizing in a small business. It's no more than just the, the big business or corporation doing that. A small business were doing that. Mexico is helping a lot, and also Canada. Now, my question is to you, Secretary of Commerce, what you are doing to facilitate these encounters between, you know, just in North America, but throughout the world. The world is globalizing in a small business. So, so let me tell you two things. First of all, uh, 
we offer at the Department of Commerce a service called the Gold Key Service. If you're a business and you want to learn where in the world your product is competitive, we will help you figure out which markets your product is competitive in, and then we will introduce, and we have people around the world in 70 countries that will help you then take your product to that country. I just got back 10 days ago from uh, my first trade mission to Mexico. We took 17 companies to Mexico to help them, introduce them to do business. But you don't have to do this with the secretary. We do this, and it's not expensive. Uh, this is something that we do for companies throughout the United States at the U United States Export Assistance Center. And I'm sure someone on my staff will help you on. There they are. There's the team right there. They will help you. So we're, as I said, we are a service organization, and there's the team, and, that's, and they are terrific. They're really good at that. From a more uh, macro standpoint, what are we doing? I was last week with the president in Mexico, meeting with the president of Canada and the president of Mexico. The top agenda items that we discussed in that trilateral conversation were trade. How do we reduce the barriers to trade? in the North American, what we call the North American platform. And this is extremely important for us to do. Uh, whether it's um, issues at the border, whether it's access for travel and tourism, whether it's issues at our airports, uh, whether we just, the president just signed an executive order called Single Window, where if you're going to be sending goods between the three countries, you'll fill out one form as opposed to needing different forms from different parts of the government. Uh, and so we're very much committed to breaking down those barriers. And with Mexico, we have something called the high level economic dialogue. It doesn't, that doesn't matter. We have actually a list of items that we're collectively working to break down these barriers. And the coolest part about it is my list and my counterpart's list in Mexico are exactly the same. We're now trying to trilateralize that with the uh, Canadians to say, okay, here are the things we commit to get done to try and make trade easier for all of you. Great. I think we have time for uh, one more. Hi. Uh, Hi. Nice to listen to you today. There's a very rigid procurement process, as you know, in the government, and I'm wondering if you see that as inhibiting the kind of private-public partnerships we need to drive innovation when a company has a great idea that they want to bring forward? I, I worry that um, the requirements for procurement are so many that it makes it very difficult for a smaller business to actually comply with all the requirements. And in fact, that's an issue that we're um, looking at, the Na National Economic Council is looking at to try and address. I'm not particular, I'm not intimately familiar with the exact process, but I worry about it and something that I want to make sure that we're removing barriers to business as opposed to adding them. Okay. Uh, with that, we'd like to uh, ask everyone to remain seated for some uh, brief closing remarks. Thank you, Secretary Pritzker. Thank you. Before you, um, before you jump off the stage, or at least leave the room, we wanted to thank you again, Secretary Pritzker, for thank sharing you. your perspectives with us so candidly, and Jeff for guiding the conversation so well. We appreciate the participation of our partners, and of course, plug and play. This program will be available for viewing on YouTube, on the Churchill Club channel, and you have been a wonderful audience. Thank you so much for coming. Have a good day. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you.